Well, good evening, Soundside Church. Pastor Aaron coming to you and to your community group here in particular tonight. And you just read Joshua chapter 7, didn't you? Well, we've gotten used to watching Joshua experience great victory after great victory, success after success. And tonight, it all comes crashing down. You read the story of Achan and Achan's sin and the disaster at Ai. And maybe we are wondering, what in the world's going on at this point? Does Joshua still have the courage to stand? What's going on? Well, you are going to discuss some of this stuff in our groups tonight. But before we do, I just want to be your video tour guide once again and kind of draw your attention to three things in the text that I think will help you understand what's going on. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to is right here in the first verse where the Bible refers to, quote, the devoted things. The Bible said right here in Joshua 7 verse 1 that the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. Now, I'm reading from ESV. That's what it says, the devoted things. Older translations called them the accursed things. Uh, the CSB, I think, says things devoted to destruction. The New American Standard says things under the ban. And there are different ways of translating the idea because it's not a very precise idea. It is a common idea that we find in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and a lot of it here in Joshua, but understanding it is it's a little bit of a tug of war. Why? Because the word means to set apart uh, for holy usage, to set apart for God. So how do we get from setting something apart for God to devoting it to destruction? And it's not entirely clear how we do that, except that when these things were set apart for God, God told them, to go ahead and set them apart for destruction. The idea really has to do from, with um, removing something from secular usage and uh, putting it in God's hands. Now, in the case of people or religions or idols that were totally opposed to God, well, God's whole thing was, you're going to destroy them. We looked at that last week about how Israel would be kind of the human instruments of God's judgment. And so when they entered the land of Canaan, uh, when they conquered the city of Jericho, uh, they basically put the city of Jericho into God's hands, and then God told them what to do. So when it came to the gold and the silver and the bronze and the iron, God said, take that and put that into my treasury. As they would go on and conquer further cities throughout the book of Joshua, uh, God told them what things they could keep. God told them what things they could destroy. But over all of it, God was communicating to them that it all belonged to him. And I think that's an important thing for us to understand as we're reading about the Israelites basically conquering and taking possession of Canaan, is that this wasn't some sort of marauding migrant people. Uh, in some respects, this was a holy war, but it was a, a a holy war in the sense that God uh, was moving his people into this land and God was coming in not as a way of saying, hey guys, let's just go ahead and take this over, but in a way of exalting himself as the king and the people as his subjects. And so the people would uh, move from town to town, that things would be devoted to God, and God would determine what they did with it. And it was an important message for Israel to realize that whatever victories they experienced, whatever benefits they received, was still coming from God, not from the strength of their own hands. Now, that's a, a bigger concept than what's just included in this word of devoted things, but I believe that's part of what God was communicating to them. So by conquering Jericho and the people couldn't keep anything, they couldn't touch anything, that was kind of God's way of saying, you know what, this victory is all me. And all the other victories are going to be all me too, but I'm going to allow you to play a bigger part in it. Of course, when they went on to the next village of Ai, uh, they missed some of that message, and you're going to look at that tonight. Well, they did go to Ai, didn't they? And they were defeated. Do you realize what the Bible says about the, the result uh, that happened to Israel after they were defeated? The Bible tells us here in verse 5 that the hearts of the people melted and became as water. The hearts of the people melted. The hearts of the Israelites melted. Now, you've heard that phrase before, didn't you? 
Back in chapter 5, after God, parted the, the, after God parted the Jordan River, God was bringing the people in, the Bible tells us that the hearts of the Canaanites melted. Rahab told the spies that they had heard about what God had done for the people of Israel in crossing the Red Sea and how they defeated the other kings. And she said that the, the hearts of our people have melted. Well, guess what? Just as the hearts of the Canaanites melted when they realized that God was on the side of the Israelites, now the hearts of the Israelites are melting because they realize God is not with them. It's a very, very important phrase, and it's meant to take us back and say, uh-oh, God isn't on the side of the Israelites anymore. What has happened? And of course, we know what's happened, and uh, we'll dive into that just a little bit more. But as we do... As we do, we're going to encounter another idea in this chapter that is going to feel very, very foreign to us, especially in 21st century America. And it is the concept of corporate responsibility. That's the phrase I'm going to use. Corporate responsibility. What does that mean? That means that individuals who are part of a body are responsible for the actions of that body. And that the body can be responsible for the actions of the individuals that make up that body. Now, as Americans, 21st century Americans, Westerners, we are very, very much in love with the concept of individualism. Okay, uh, but this idea of corporate responsibility that I might experience the consequences of someone else's actions, well, we don't grapple with that very well, and yet it forms the basis of understanding a lot of what happens, not only in the chapter here in Joshua, but also understanding a lot of what happens in other parts of Scripture. And maybe, just maybe, we need to kind of rethink our understanding of individual responsibility, corporate responsibility, and maybe take a, a second look at the relationships that God has placed around us. We're going to do that tonight. Uh, that's going to form part of our discussion, and so I'm going to turn it over to your community group leader now.